Hello, and thank you for joining us at Canyon Creek Church Online. We are one church that meets in multiple locations. For more information about who we are, visit us online at canyoncreek.church. We would also love to know how we can pray for you today. Be sure to put your requests in the comment section below this live stream. With that said, let's dive into this week's message. Well, welcome. It's good to see you today. If I haven't met you, I'm Di Beals, part of the staff here at our central campus, and it is my privilege to bring you along with me in the journey of our last uh, message in our Stranger Things series until we pick it up again in a year. So we plan to pick it up again in 2019, and so uh, today will be our final installment for 2018. And I think you'll agree with me this series has been incredible for learning, but also for bizarre. (laughs) Stranger Things is a really appropriate title. Uh, If you've missed any of our messages, we invite you to go to our website and uh, look up some of those messages and give them a listen. Uh, But this will be our last message in the series, and we've seen so far in this series that God has asked uh, this man, Ezekiel, uh, a young man, to do some very bizarre things. And we've really just tried to highlight them as best we can, maybe even modernize them just a tad bit. But Ezekiel is asked to do these things by God in order to get the people's attention. So God is using Ezekiel, and he's using Ezekiel to do very strange things in order to get their attention. Now, these people we've discovered have hardened their hearts. They've chosen to be rebellious. They've made excuses for their sin. They've procrastinated. They've chosen to worship idols and false gods instead of the one true God. And God is fed up with their behavior. And so he's going to these extreme lengths because of his love, but also because he is fed up with their behavior. And so, so far in this series, uh, we have discovered, so I'll recap it so we're all on the same page, we've discovered that Ezekiel has been asked to do things like lie on his side for over a year. Can we just stop there and say, what? (laughs) Where everyone can see him and have very minimal provisions of food and water and to cook that food over cow dung, okay? Okay. Also, we've seen that Ezekiel has had to take a sword, use it like a razor, shave his head, shave his beard, take all of the hair, divide it into three piles, burn one-third of the hair, take one-third of the hair and scatter it across a map that's supposed to be a replica of the city, and then chop it all up with the sword, and then take one-third and scatter it out into the wind, which was to represent the destruction, the fire, the violence, the famine, the disease, all the good things that were about to come to the people. We've seen that Ezekiel has been asked by God to cry out, stomp his feet, and yell, alas, while clapping his hands in order to get the people's attention. And we've seen Ezekiel have a vision or a dream of people with X's on their heads, and the people with X's on their heads are the ones who cry out and weep because of the sin, and those who don't cry out and weep are struck dead. So these are some very traumatizing things, and Ezekiel weeps on his face before God. And so that brings us to today, where we will look at Ezekiel chapter 12, where we're going to find that the time has come. There will be no more warnings. This is it. The time has come. Would you pray with me before we launch into this chapter? God, I know that this is is a group of people who don't even know yet what I feel led to share with them. And so I'm going to pray on all of our behalf for soft hearts. God, I'm going to ask that you would give every one of us, including me, uh, ears that would be open to hear and willing to hear and eyes that would be open to see and willing to see and hearts that would be responsive to you, even if it's painful, even if it costs us something. So God, would you stir something inside of us that desires to surrender before you? And we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you have your Bible, I would love for you to turn to Ezekiel chapter 12. If you don't, the words will be on the screen for you. We're going to make our way through uh, some of these verses here in this chapter, and we're going to start with Ezekiel chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I'm going to read from the New Living Translation, so if you're reading from your Bible and you have a different translation, it may sound a little different, but New Living should be what's on the screen as well. And we start off in chapter 12, verse 1, where it says, And again a message came to me, that's to Ezekiel, from the Lord. And the message said, son of man, so Ezekiel, you live among rebels who have eyes but refuse to see, 
and they have ears but refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious people. So right off the bat, God is describing the condition of the people, which is not good, and it is described as rebellious. Now, this is not anything new. In fact, God's people have already been called rebellious and disobedient and hard-hearted and lots of things that are even worse than those descriptions. So I thought it would be appropriate, though, for us to review a little bit of the condition of the people that has led us to this point as an introduction to this chapter. So if you've missed any of the series, these would be the important things that you and I would need to know to understand what's happening. Number one, God's people are already living in exile. Okay, they're already captives Uh, prisoners, essentially, in a foreign land. They've already been taken from their home country, and they've been forced to journey to a country that is not their own to live subject to somebody else's rule. Okay, that's an important thing to know. Their king, when this happened, was Jehoiakim, and he had only been king for three months when King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came and seized the city and took Jehoiakim captive, and then decided that he would take uh, as many royals or people of official title or people of influence as he could with him. In other words, he took all the people who could stand up against him captive, and he left those who were weaker or poorer to fend for themselves. He also stripped every bit of anything precious from the royal palace and from the temple of God. And when I say stripped, scripture says stripped away or cut away because most of the walls and the furnishings were coated in gold. And so these things were stripped apart. All of that was taken as spoils to a land where now part of God's people are living in exile. And by the way, it's been five years since this happened. Okay, so I don't know if that's been said anywhere in this series, but for five years, they've already been living in exile. Now, I don't know about you, but I like to think that it doesn't take me that long to learn a lesson. I like to think that I'm not so boneheaded and stubborn and into my own way that I can't actually learn from the mistakes that have got me in that situation. But I've come to find out that most of us, me included, don't actually learn very quickly. In fact, many of us, rather than repent, we do exactly what we see happening in Scripture, which is we harden our hearts and we rebel against God. Ouch. (laughs) So we find the people of Israel living in exile, so banned from their own country. Their king is in prison, and they are still rebelling against God. They're worshiping anything and everything but God alone who could save them. And so now, not only does God describe his people as rebellious, but he describes them as having eyes who don't, eyes that don't see and ears that don't hear. And, and this was a nod to the idols that they were worshiping. In fact, there's a few places in Scripture you can find references like this. Basically, let me paraphrase. Are you really so dumb that you worship something that has carved out eyes and a carved out mouth but carved out ears but can't see, can't talk, and can't hear? And I'm right here. I'm God. And I think we we should kind of get that because we, just as foolishly, have eyes and ears but don't see and don't hear. And so since they are still hard-hearted to God, the coming destruction is going to be worse than what they've already experienced. And so that brings us to verse 3. And beginning in verse 3 is where we find Ezekiel's next assignment in order to get the attention of God's people. So Ezekiel chapter 3, I'm going to read 3 through 6 just so we kind of get the story and then I'll kind of break it down for us a little bit. So verse 3 says, So now, son of man, that's Ezekiel, Pretend that you are being sent into exile. Pack the few items that an exile could carry and leave your home to go somewhere else. Do this right in front of the people so they can see you, for perhaps they will pay attention to this, even though they are such rebels. Bring your baggage outside during the day so they can watch you, and then in the evening, as they are watching, leave your house as captives do when they begin a long march to a distant land. Dig a hole through the wall while they are watching and go through it, and as they watch, lift your pack to your shoulders and walk away into the night. Cover your face so you cannot see the land you are leaving, for I have made you a sign for the people of Israel. So let's talk through what is the meaning of these Verses. What is it that Ezekiel is being asked to do here? So Ezekiel is asked by God 
to pack a few things that exiles would take into captivity and then leave his home in broad daylight so he can get the attention of as many people as possible, walk around in front of them so they wonder what on earth he's doing, and maybe they might take warning by this, which is interesting because they didn't learn when he laid on his side for a year and a half and cooked food over cow dung. They didn't learn when he took the sword and cut all the hair and burned the hair. They, they haven't learned yet, but yet God is still giving them another chance to learn. So I did some research on what an exile might carry uh, with them into exile. And so I brought some visual aids for us. Um, in all of the research that I did, <laughs> this is an authentic Israeli staff, people. <laughs> um, Remember, exile is a political move, okay? You have to have that in your head because though these people are being taken captive, they are essentially being relocated to another place where they have to take up residence and live in houses and function as these people have been doing for five years, okay? So they have to actually move. So it was important that they actually take with them into exile things that would help them in this relocation. And so when I looked it up, I found that the things that an exile would carry Okay, it was like definitive. I found this in more than one place. They would carry a staff. They would carry a scrip, which I'll explain in a second, a purse, shoes, and important household goods, specifically cookware, things necessary to eat with, tables, and especially chairs. I don't have a chair up here. <laughs> I was going to draw the line at the chair. They had to travel light, but remember, they had to take up residence somewhere else. Now, they had to travel light, but they had to travel far, and they had to carry whatever it is that they brought. So each item was important. It was important for their survival on the journey. It was important for their relocation when they got to the end of their journey. It was also important for Ezekiel's purposes because each item had significance in what they represented. So item number one was a staff, authentic Hebrew staff, or also known as an REI walking stick. And the staff was intended to provide support in a journey by foot. Now, incidentally, this journey was about 600 miles, which is like walking from Seattle to Redding, California. So that just puts a little perspective to it. This was actually a long journey. So this was intended for support and to protect them on a long journey. Now, the fellow Israelis that Ezekiel would have been demonstrating this to would recognize this because they all have one. Also, remember, they all are in exile. So they just made the 500-mile, 600-mile journey within the last few years. So they would recognize this. Okay, so we have the staff. I have my trusty staff. They also would have a script. Now, I thought this was pretty fun because a scrip was essentially, it was also called a shepherd's bag, okay? So essentially, a scrip was like a small bag that you would wear around your waist in order to carry scraps. So the derivative word is scrap. So they, meet, they come from the same word. Scraps would be like those few things that you need provision-wise to sustain you while you're on a trip or while you're out caring for animals. So I would like to propose that that was uh, the original fanny pack way back in the day. And so I have a fanny pack that I'm just going to put on to remind you that the, uh, the captives are going to need their fanny pack. Well, now, they need provision, too. And so I brought myself some provision. I didn't want to bring bread, so I brought Girl Scout cookies that I'm going to put in my fanny pack in case I get hungry. Also, I know this is modernizing the story as, you know, this is not animal skin. This is probably straight from China. But uh, I also can't go anywhere without chapstick, and so I have that in my bag too. All right, so we have our staff. We have our script. Now, this was to remind the people, both of these items, you're going on a very long trip. You're not going to be able to take very much with you. I hope you really want to go on this trip. All right, next they would need a purse. Now, it's not our kind of a purse. This would be a bag that you would wear over your shoulder, also known as a day kind uh, backpack uh, from REI. And so uh, in their backpack, they would need things like an extra cloak or they would need a North Face jacket. <laughs> they would need some extra sandals or some running shoes just in case. And I also brought along uh, some important eating utensils. So I have my pot, which is multi-purpose because I can eat out of it. 
And also, I have a spoon, and I'm only going to put this on my shoulder momentarily because it's so awkward, but you, you all feel my pain. Not to completely mock the story, I want you to understand that when Ezekiel put these items on and carried these items around, it was intended for the people to relate immediately to what they had just endured only a few years before. It was intended for them to understand, this is your last warning, this is what's coming, and it will be worse than what you've already experienced. Uh, <laughs> It's possible Ezekiel had a chair. I mean, that's possible. He's done some pretty weird things in the series so far. I didn't bring a chair up here because I, I don't think he... Maybe. I wouldn't put it past him. But the point is that people would... Uh, their attention would be grabbed. That was, that was the hope, is that they would see that the exile was coming. But the problem is because they were hard-hearted and because they refused to surrender to God, God has to go to great lengths to continue to try to get their attention. So Ezekiel has his pack, he has his staff, he possibly has his dining room chair, and he's walking around in the middle of the day because he wants to draw attention so that the people will follow him. And they do follow him. And we know this because scripture refers to the fact that next Ezekiel is told, in the evening at your house, assuming these people have followed him and are now gathered around his house, he is to leave his house as a captive uh, like a captive would leave their city on a journey to the land of their captors. Now, so he is told to dig a hole through the wall. Now, this would be the wall of his house. Okay, remember, he's been living here now for five years, so he has a home that he lives in, and the wall would have been made of probably the typical uh, sun-dried bricks of some sort made out of dirt or clay. That's what they would have made their walls out of at that point in time. And he is told to dig out of the wall with his bare hands from the inside of his home to the outside where the people are gathered around and watching him. Now, the, this is significant, and the people would have understood this, because in this time period, the only protection you have against an enemy is the walls around your city. And so if an enemy was approaching, you would shut the gates and batten them down, and you would post guards on the wall who would try and keep the enemy from breaching the city. Well, sometimes they would breach the city through the gates, and sometimes they would actually breach the city through the walls. And it was through the holes in the walls that they would then just take the captive straight through the breaches and to their land of captivity or to their death, whatever the case may be. So they would understand the breach in the wall that Ezekiel is digging. And with his pack on his shoulders, Ezekiel would walk away into the night. The last item I brought was a scarf, and I won't put it on, but Ezekiel was to cover his face. And the reason that he was to cover his face is because a covered face would illustrate this, the shame and the sorrow of those being taken into captivity. Shame at their failure and sorrow of the captivity that awaited them probably for the rest of their lives. And so then we see in verse 7 that Ezekiel obeys everything the Lord asks him to do. Now I hold my breath a little bit here, and maybe, maybe you do too. I hold my breath a little bit because I just hope maybe they'll get it this time. <laughs> Maybe, maybe they'll surrender. Maybe they'll repent. Maybe they will turn their hearts to God. Maybe, maybe they will soften. Maybe they will see. And in verses 8 and 9, in fact, if you'll look there, you'll see at least a glimpse of maybe a sort of a response by the people. It says, The next morning this message came to me from the Lord, Son of man, these rebels, the people of Israel, have asked you, what does all of this mean? And this is what you should, should say to them. So they've asked him, what does this mean? Now, maybe they've asked before, but we have not seen that anywhere in this book so far. So, so far, this is the first recorded response of the people. And what follows in what Ezekiel replies to them is just a list of dire and awful warnings of what is to come for hard-hearted, rebellious people who refuse to surrender to God. And it's, it's the exile to come, and it's the exile mostly for those who are still left in, is in Jerusalem who, who have a new king and are hoping that they escaped all of this. So it's the exile for them. It tells of captivity, death, war, famine, disease. In fact, Ezekiel trembles while he's uh, eating food and 
and shakes while he's drinking water to demonstrate the terror that will come upon them when the enemy comes and the despair and the destruction and the violence that waits for them. And you may be wondering, why would God go to these lengths? Why would he do all of these things? And God himself answers that question in a couple of the verses to follow. In fact, three times he says, all of this is so that they will know that I am God, that I am the Lord. He goes to great lengths to demonstrate his love, but also to demonstrate that he alone is God. He is willing to get our attention, but it is also to remind us I am in charge. So after reading all of this, maybe you're like me and you think, God, what should my response be? (laughs) How how do we bridge the gap here? I think we read this and we have a hard time relating it to our lives, yes? <laughs> and that's understandable. I think sometimes our response is what we saw last week when Pastor Brandon preached from chapter 11, which is the people's hearts become more hard. And I think sometimes we put off responding because we believe we have more time. And sometimes we downplay things like sin and think it's not really that bad, especially compared to somebody else or someone, something else. The response of the people to all that Ezekiel has done to this point, to all the lengths that God has gone through Ezekiel to demonstrate his love and to get their attention is actually heartbreaking. And the response of the people is found in verse 22. In fact, I'll read 21 also. It says, again, a message came to me from the Lord. Verse 22, son of man, you've heard that proverb that they quote in Israel, Time passes, and prophecies come to nothing. In other words, there was this wise saying going around amongst the people, and it went something to the effect of, yeah, they keep saying all these bad things are going to happen, but they haven't happened yet, and they probably never will. And it was the lie that we have more time, or God won't really actually punish us like he says that he will. They believed the lie that they had more time, and for that reason, they refused to repent, and they refused to surrender. Let Let me talk to the parents that are here today, specifically, because I think we learn a lot about life through parenting, unfortunately. Lots of life lessons are learned through stubborn, God bless them, children. No matter what age your kids are, or if you've already raised your kids, you can think of battles that are very hard fought, where it is your will versus the will of your child. And you know that you aren't perfect, and neither am I, but I think we would agree that we know more than our kids, I hope, (laughs) and likely we want them to surrender their will to our will because we have their best interests at heart. Yes? Do you agree with that? So I really struggled with what's an example I could use because I actually have two from last week and I thought, too soon, die, too soon. (laughs) I'll save those for another day, but they are so good it was hard. (laughs) Um, So I struggled and I thought, okay, too soon last week. I decided on an example because sometimes it's embarrassing to my children maybe if I use them as examples. And so I thought, I'll use an example that includes my two boys and my two nephews so you don't actually know which of the four boys this incriminates. And then they're lumped and thrown under the bus too. So (laughs) there was a period of time where I was not only in charge of my two boys but also my two nephews and I would babysit them a lot for for a few summers in a row. And this one particular summer, uh, I'll just call them my four boys, my four boys were really into bike riding. And uh, they were really into bike riding, and they were also really into struggling to remember to wear their bike helmet and also remember to watch for cars if they should happen to accidentally ride into the road. And so by struggling, I say they were flat out refusing to put on helmets. And so um, I think you would agree with me that it's in their best interest that they wear a bike helmet and that they watch for cars when they ride their bike, and probably not even actually go in the road because the sidewalks are nice and wide and flat. There's no reason to ride straight out into the road. Okay, so you would agree that's in the best interest of these children, yes? I'm not asking anything that's really too out of the way or too absurd. I'm asking for something that's good for them. And so I let them go out to ride one afternoon with a very stern warning and a very stern promise hanging in the air, and it went something like this. Boys... We can do this the easy way, 
well, we can do this the hard way. You will put your helmets on, and you will watch before you ride into the street for cars, or there will be consequences. And so after the reminders, the warnings, the threats, and the promises, and they all shook their head yes, raised one hand, put hand over their heart, swore, promised. I watched those four boys run out. I literally watched from the window, and I'm not exaggerating this story. I watched them run out into the driveway. They each picked up their bike. Every single one of them left their helmet on the ground, and one in particular rode his bike straight up the driveway, didn't, I mean, this is two, 14 seconds later maybe, doesn't even turn his head either direction and rides straight into the street in front of a car. Well, that car slammed on its brakes, missed this particular child by millimeters, kid fell off the bike, driver jumps out of the car, both of them are crying, I run out of the house, I run up the street, I pick up the child off the ground, and I, <laughs> I say something like this. Son, I told you we could do this the easy way or we could do this the hard way. You've clearly chosen the hard way. <laughs> and so you have forfeited the right to ride this bike. You will repent and ask forgiveness of the driver who you just scarred for life. You will repent and ask forgiveness of the other three boys that you're with who are also scarred for life and thought they just were about to watch you die. You will repent and ask forgiveness of your parents who you disobeyed when you promised that you would wear your helmet and not ride into the street. And now you will have the following consequences, which I then listed off. And I said, and this is for disobeying because I am serious about the rules that I have given you and I will have my way. I will have my way. Now, the examples we could give about kids, I think, could go on and on, and I could give you lots, and you could give me lots, because are, children are great examples of rebellious, hard-hearted, stubborn, disobedient human beings. And these little humans that we're in charge of, or big humans, as it may be in your case, if they're teenagers, that's a whole other story, uh, just will not surrender their will and obey. And guess what? My will is stronger than your will. So if we get in a fight, I will win. I will have my way as your parent. But then there are stories that our parents could tell about us, <laughs> about these humans that they were in charge of who refused to lay down their will, these disobedient, hard-hearted, rebellious humans who would not surrender their will. And then there's another one that could also offer an opinion and tell stories about us. And in the Bible, he's called God the Father. And maybe you've forgotten that God, your Father, knows more than you do. And maybe we've forgotten that God, our Father, really has our best interests at heart. And that he wants us to surrender our will. And he wants us to do this because he wants what's best for us. And God, our Father, has determined that we will obey him. We can do it the easy way or we can do it the hard way. But he will have his way in the end. And so our response is often to harden our heart. And God's response is, you won't give up the alcohol? You won't, you won't lay down the drugs? You won't stop smoking that thing? You won't stop looking at the porn? You won't let go of the unforgiveness? You won't give up the jealousy? You won't lay down the bitterness? You won't, you won't lay down the anger problem? You won't give up your pride? You won't stop being selfish? How about your anger or your jealousy? You won't surrender your will and obey? Well then, you will forfeit your rights. And you will endure the consequences because I am serious about my rules and because I will have my way. See, we can do this, and this is God talking, my son, my daughter. We can do this the easy way or we can do this the hard way. But I will have my way. And I want you to know I am the Lord. And this is how God the Father responded to the people in this story in Ezekiel 2. His reply is basically, all right, you've chosen to be rebellious. You've chosen the hard way, but I will have my way. And then God addresses the lie that they believe. Remember the lie? The lie that they had more time. The lie that we believe too, that we have more time. That we can play around. We can mess around in sin. We can mess around in disobedience. We can, we can, we can just keep that one little area and lay down all the other areas, and that's enough for now because we have more time. And God says in verse 23, he says one phrase that should make us tremble. The time has come. 
There's no more chances. There's no more warnings. All of the destruction, all of the consequences, all the things you've been warned of, they're going to come on you quickly. They're going to come on you and you didn't even see it coming even though you've been warned about it. And he goes on to say in the rest of the verses in this chapter, there will be no more delays. I will fulfill my threat of destruction. In other words, I will have my way. I will fulfill my will. The people thought they had more time, but God said, you're out of time. The time has come. The people thought that they had escaped punishment. They thought we've already suffered the worst of it, but God says there will be no more delays for what is about to come. And sadly, less than six years later, every shred of every bit of what Ezekiel prophesied was fulfilled exactly as it was prophesied. So let me ask again, what should our response be? And I would like to propose to you that our response is to surrender. Yeah. But the thing is, we don't, we don't want to surrender. Can I be the voice today that says, you can do this the hard way, or you can do this the easy way, but God will have his way in your life. And we're so similar to the people that we're reading about in the Bible. The actual circumstances or choices might be different, but we're so similar in how we behave in the people we're reading about in this series. We have blind eyes because we don't want to see, and we have deaf ears because we don't want to hear, and we don't want to soften our hearts, and we don't want to change, and we don't want to surrender. And so we pick up our bag and we pick up our staff, and we march off, in, off into captivity and into exile. We march off into slavery, and we have no one to blame but ourselves. Exile is nobody's choice but mine when I refuse to surrender. I don't get to say, why is God so mean to me? Why did God forget about me? Does God not see me? Does he not love me? He keeps letting me go through all these hard things, and we can't blame anyone but us for not being willing to surrender. And here's the key. The people we're reading about in this word, if they would have surrendered, God would have forgiven. And that's for you and I right now. If we would surrender, God would forgive. So what is surrender? Surrender is me taking my will, my way of doing it, my way, and saying, God, I lay down my way and my will so that you can have your way and your will. Surrender is not my way, your way. And I can do it the easy way or I can do it the hard way and so can you. And the thing is, God is just waiting for us to choose. Are you going to do it the easy way or are you going to do it the hard way? Listen, the next five chapters of Ezekiel are bleak. <laughs> I hope we don't preach on them next year when we do this series because Israel is described as a false prophet, an idolater, a useless vine, an unfaithful wife, and a whore. But since we're concluding this series, at least for a year, I had to find some moment of hope, some little piece of redemption for us. So if you have your Bible, we'll flip over to one last verse, and this is in Ezekiel 18. Ezekiel 18, verse 30, is our moment of redemption. It's our hope. It's the bright light in a dark canvas. And this is God talking. He says, repent. Turn from your sins. Don't let them destroy you. Put all your rebellion behind you. And find yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. See, this is our instruction for right now today too. Right now. You're here for a reason. It's to hear this, every one of you. Staff, key volunteers, leaders, young, old, all of us. We all need to hear this. This is our instruction. How do we surrender? Number one, repent. You know what repentance is? Open your eyes and see. Open your ears and hear. And open your mouth and call it what it really is. If it's sin, call it sin. If it's disobedience, call it disobedience and determine, I don't want that anymore. Ask for forgiveness. And this is provided through Jesus Christ. See, in, in this part of the Old Testament, this part of the, the book, they, the things they had to do to come before God and be right before him are much different than us. Because for us, the way has been paved by Jesus Christ. And we're about to celebrate that in just two weeks. Easter is all about Jesus paid the ultimate price for our sin. He paid the price we couldn't pay for ourselves, And all we have to do is ask him to forgive us. The work's already been done. 
So repent and ask for forgiveness. Number two, turn from sin. Stop rebelling. Stop sinning. Stop doing it. Stop looking at it. Stop smoking it. Stop saying it. Stop participating in it. Stop making excuses. Stop waiting. Stop procrastinating. Stop saying I have more time. But turn. So repent. Turn from sin. And number three, find a new heart and a new spirit. In fact, one translation says, go get for yourself a new heart and a new spirit. See, we read last week that God will give us a new heart and a new spirit. And so sometimes we get that mixed up because he will do that, but only after we do these things. And so we sit around and we think, well, when, when's God going to give me that new heart? When's he going to give me that new soft spirit? I guess I'll just keep waiting. But we haven't repented. We haven't called sin, sin. We haven't opened our eyes. We haven't opened our ears. We haven't turned from anything. We haven't stopped smoking, stopped looking, stopped participating. We haven't stopped going to that place we shouldn't go to. And because of that, we can't have the soft heart. And so the soft heart, we have to go and get for ourselves. And how do we do that? We turn to God. We turn away from sin, and we turn to God, and we ask for help. We don't settle. We don't make excuses. We take a step toward him, away from sin, toward God. I know that is like, maybe that sounds too simple. It is supposed to be that simple. The hard part is admitting that we sin, admitting that we keep covering it up, admitting that we lie, admitting that we participate in things we don't want anyone to ever know, ever, but God already knows And he's saying, we can do this the easy way, or we can do it the hard way. It's up to you. Which do you pick? But the time has come. The time is now. I'm not waiting any longer. I want you to turn your life over to me. And so I'm going to ask if you will bow your heads. In fact, if you will bow your heads and stand to your feet with me. With your heads bowed and with your eyes closed, this you're probably already there, but this is your moment of reflection. Okay, so I'm I'm going to step out on a limb. I'm going to be obedient here because I realize in a room that is not full, I'm going to take a risk, but it's not me risking anything. It's, this is me obeying God. And the risk is that I may make a call for you to respond and, and you might not want to respond. Or maybe in this room is all kinds of super holy people. And I'll take that chance. Because I can't go past this point without actually asking, are you right with God? So if you are in this room, everyone has their head bowed and their eyes closed. If you are in this room and you know you are not right with God, whether you don't have a relationship with him at all, or you know I am just like those Israelites. It may not be the same sin, but there is definitely sin in my life. And I'm going to call it what it is. It is sin. If that's you, would you raise your hand? Up and down. Thank you. I'm going to ask you to be so bold. And you, this is up to you if you want to make this decision or not. There's no judgment in this room. There was a good amount of hands raised. I would love for you to be so bold as to step out of your seat into the aisle. Would you do that for me? Step into an aisle. Thank you. Thank you. If you have an area of rebellion in your life, if you have an area of hard-heartedness, if you have an area of disobedience, this is between you and God. This is you saying, God, I am serious. I'm going to call this what it is. I'm not going to make excuses for it anymore. I'm not going to put it off anymore. I'm going to deal with it right now. And so by stepping into an aisle, you're saying, I'm serious. Thank you. Would you pray with me? In fact, everyone in this room, would you put a hand over your heart? This is just symbolic. This is just us saying, God, would you search our hearts? He already sees everything that's in there anyway. He knows what's in your head. He knows what you think about. He knows what you look at. He knows what you do. He already knows. So would you agree with me right now as I pray? God, we want to be deadly serious about sin. We don't want to be disobedient to you. So all across this room, I'm speaking on behalf of a room full of people when I say, we want to obey you, God. We want to surrender our lives to you. We understand that we can do this the easy way or the hard way. And we are saying, God, would you forgive us? We want to bring ourselves into alignment with you. God, we ask for your forgiveness. We want to turn away from those things that we know are sin against you. We want to to stop disobeying and being hard-hearted and being rebellious. We want to have hearts that are soft to you, that when you call us to do something, we obey, that when you speak to us, we have ears that hear, and when you show us things, we have eyes that see. So all across this room, we say, God, would you forgive us? Would you just say that with me? God, would you forgive me? 
God, would you forgive me? God, would you make me right before you? Come on, I, I accept your forgiveness. I turn from my sin. Give me a soft heart and a soft spirit. God, would you seal that by your Holy Spirit? Would you let that grow down deep and take root inside of our hearts that we would be people, individuals, but also a group of people who are set apart for you. We thank you for how you're moving in our hearts and our lives. Give us the strength now to walk away from what we were doing before that was sin and bring ourselves into alignment with you. And we say thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. We would love to connect with you throughout your week, so be sure to connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or again by visiting us online at canyoncreek.church. We hope you have a fantastic week.